welcome one and all. Today we are going to wrap up John chapter 6. Before I have you read with me the focal passage, I just want to do a bit of review of what we covered last week. And I'm only going to back up, uh, oh, let's see, uh, to verse 52. How about that? Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, the one who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, the one who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. He's not talking about cannibalism. He is speaking spiritually. And I spoke a whole lot about that last week, so I won't re-preach last week. But if you will, read with me the focal passage today, which I've already read the first verse of. Let's go to it. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So we know where it took place. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Now I will back this up, and we'll begin giving some commentary on this. Now, from time to time, all of us will come to a crisis when we, even the most devoted followers of Jesus Christ, will come to a crisis of faith. Have any of you ever experienced a crisis of faith? I have. Uh, more than once had a major crisis of faith. So in this particular case, the context of this... Oh, I don't know what that sound was, but... <clears throat> <laughs> 
Um, so I want to put you in the picture here of what's going on. Jesus has just given the first of the I am statements, I am the bread of life. He's taught all about it, and I've been going over it pretty heavily in the last several weeks. But it comes down to this. It's time to make a choice. It's time to make a choice. And in fact, every day we all make choices. But here, all through this chapter, verse, uh, chapter 6 of the Gospel of John, we are seeing the contrast between true disciples and false disciples. All through it. You'll notice, if you read through the, the, the chapter, you'll see that he, we start off with the feeding of the 5,000 on what we currently call the Golan Heights. Huge crowds coming. Out of that huge crowd, we look to the end of what we just read, and many of the disciples left. Okay? What is the contrast? The true disciples and the false disciples. The false disciples are coming to Jesus. They are following Jesus for false reasons. They're following Jesus for their own agenda. We sometimes, even if we are the truest of followers of Jesus, can also, early on, especially in our development, it, it, our spiritual development, it tends to be that we may have some false idea that could come from anywhere, could come from our upbringing, could come from watching movies, could be a, a false concept of what Jesus or, and who Jesus is. All of us have to grow in Christ by being in his word, being in fellowship with him, by being in fellowship in church, studying the Bible and learning to know the real Jesus from the real Bible, not popular culture. Popular culture through movies and TV and even well-meaning teachers can give us some false ideas of what to expect from Jesus. Chapter 6, if you want to reread it, you will see the contrast. Now, let me open up my notes before I get myself off on another tangent. We all know I have that tendency. Verse 60, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a difficult saying. Who can listen to it? Difficult saying. It's difficult not just because he's saying, Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Jesus explains later on, and we just read it, he's saying that he's speaking spiritually. For all intents and purposes, that's what he's saying. They're not just saying that it's hard to understand, though it can be for some people. The word here is scleros, and it, you've heard of multiple sclerosis. Uh, it's a hardening of soft tissues in the body. There's also uh, arteriosclerosis, a hardening of the arteries. It's where there is a loss of function, uh, a loss of necessary flexibility in, in the arteries of the body, and it can cause high blood pressure, heart attacks, and stroke, and so forth and so on. Well, this is a hardening. A hardening of the heart that is going on in the folks that are listening to this, but it's also hard in the respect that it's difficult to believe. That's what he's really getting to here, is that this is difficult to believe. G.K. Chesterton said, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. If you've been around churches long, you've probably heard that quote a hundred times. It's in multiple commentaries that I read. It comes up on this passage on, on a regular basis. Following Jesus is not easy. It's not easy. And I want to acknowledge that. There are some preachers and teachers out there that want to give you the rainbows, happiness. It's going to be a rose garden. Just come to Jesus and everything's going to be as wonderful, wonderful, wonderful 
puppy dog kisses and rainbows. That's not true. In eternity, yes, it's going to be like that. But here in this life, following Jesus does not make your life necessarily easy. Okay? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? Now mind you, Jesus, he's not talking to just the twelve. He's talking to a whole bunch of disciples. The Greek word is mathetes. I don't know if that matters to you. But it applies to anyone who is following. It doesn't necessarily differentiate between the true followers and the false followers. There are a lot of false followers of Christianity. A lot of them. Percentage-wise, if we just said, okay, take the 12 disciples, the, the core 12. One of them is a devil, Jesus said. So if the same statistics applied here, I don't know how many people we have here, and I'm not about to count, but the same statistics applied here, there's someone in our presence here this morning listening to my voice, or on Facebook, or later on on YouTube, who is not yet, I say yet, a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus Christ. Yet. Okay? So I'm not, don't, don't get too scared yet. You still have the opportunity if you're, you're that person. Does this cause you to stumble? The word here in Greek is scandalizo. I say it with a little Italian accent there for some reason. I have no idea why. <laughs> I'm sure I butchered it. If for the Greek students out there, they probably didn't like that at all. But to stumble, is, does, is it offensive? The meaning in the Greek is to ensnare, to trap, or to cause to stumble. The implication of this word is to trap and kill in the Greek. To trap and kill your faith. Does Jesus teaching trap and kill your ability to believe in him? I have heard and seen on a number of occasions people that in every single aspect of their life that I knew of were true followers of Jesus Christ who bristled at the words of Jesus yes, I know, hard to believe who bristled at the words of Jesus because they felt that those words were being wrongly interpreted that there was some other meaning to them. Listen to Jesus. Don't put your emphasis on what, how someone interprets Jesus' words. Yes, there are tools to learn how to understand Scripture. There are basic tools. It's not rocket science. I could teach you in 20 minutes. I try to do it a little bit up here every week. Listen to the words of Jesus. Trust Jesus. Jesus is absolutely 145% trustworthy. Okay, that's not really a real percentage, but you know what I mean. You can trust him. Trust him. Don't listen to somebody who's telling you that what he's saying doesn't really mean that. Jesus himself says, more often than not, he's using common things for all of us, bread and so forth and so on. And he tells us this is spiritual. It's obvious, so I'm not telling you don't believe Jesus said this. But I'm, it's obvious when Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, he's obviously not saying actually do that. Now we've got Lord's Supper in a little while. After this service, we're going to have a separate little service, the Lord's Supper, communion. And we're going to symbolically eat Jesus' flesh and drink Jesus' blood. But this is symbolic. And the language Jesus has just used is also symbolic. It is spiritual in nature. Does this cause you to stumble? So I ask you, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? We know, if you've read enough of the scriptures, you know that that's exactly what he's going to do <laughs> later on. 
The disciples are going to watch him literally ascend to the clouds and beyond. And he's saying, what if you saw me do that? Now, mind you, he's speaking to all of this crowd. There are Jewish leaders there in this, in this uh, uh, temple or synagogue in, in Capernaum. There are false followers and there are true followers. There is tear among the wheat, so to speak. So he's saying, how much evidence do you need? Remember, just the day before this, one day before, maybe even only 12 hours before, Jesus fed 5,000 men and their families from very little. The hugest by scope miracle that Jesus performed in the Gospels. And the very next morning, a whole bunch of them followed him across where Jesus, remember, had walked on water and then instantly brought them once he came to the boat. Instantly, boom, they were on the shore where they wanted to go. A double miracle. Okay? Jesus has been performing miracles left and right for months and months and months. And they, they come to him and what they say to him is, show us a sign. In other words, what have you done for me lately, pal? They're only there for what they can get from Jesus. They're there for their own purposes, not for a relationship with Jesus, not to submit to Jesus, not to learn from Jesus. In fact, they openly reject that Jesus came down from heaven. They openly reject it. They do not believe his word. That's one of the distinctions you need to remember between a false disciple and a true disciple. See, Jesus drew all kinds of false disciples to himself when he performed miracles. Fantastic miracles. All kinds of people, ooh, ah, they love the miracles. Lots of people are drawn to the supernatural. I know people who claim to believe in Jesus, but they're a little weak and soft on their so-called faith in Jesus, yet they follow everything about Bigfoot, UFOs. You know, Bigfoot is... Uh, is the world champion in hide-and-seek. <laughs> they believe all kinds of stuff. And I don't mean to offend anyone here, but I know people who spend way more time following the search for Bigfoot and, than they do following Jesus Christ. And yet they have more faith in the existence of Bigfoot than they do in Jesus Christ. Now you tell me, is that a real believer? Or is that a false believer? Just food for thought. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. This is Jesus telling you plainly, if you believe his words, if you believe his words, don't, if you believe him and you believe his words, you have life. The Spirit, capital S, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Your human nature can accomplish nothing apart from Jesus Christ, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from believing the word of God. Okay? The words that I have spoken to you, the words he's just spoken, our spirit, and our life. Okay? He's essentially saying, I'm speaking of spiritual things. 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who did not believe. Knew from the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning, the beginning. He knew from the beginning. It says he knew that whose names would be written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. There was never a time ever that God did not know who would come to Jesus. There was never ever a time. God has known forever and ever and ever and ever, amen, who would come to Jesus, who would come to him 
through Jesus. And he knows forever and ever and ever, amen, who would not come to Jesus. That's a hard, jagged, bitter pill for a lot of people to swallow. But God knows all things. He knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. So that's what I want you to understand. He is absolutely sovereign over everything. He is absolutely sovereign. Has it ever occurred to you, I've said this before, it's just kind of a dumb joke, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? Stuff doesn't occur to God. God is the uncaused cause. He is the uncaused. He, he is the self-existent one. Everything happens because he makes it happen in one way, shape, or form. Whether he's allowing it to happen for a reason or whether he's causing it himself, he is sovereign. <clears throat> They didn't believe Jesus came down from heaven. He was saying, For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Does this mean that if it wasn't granted to you, you couldn't come to Jesus? Yeah, it does. If you have come to Jesus, it's because the Father granted it. When people don't come to Jesus, it's because God hasn't given them, given it to them to come to Jesus. I know that's a hard, jagged, bitter pill to swallow. I understand it. But here's what he, he didn't he say that if anyone comes to him, he will not deny them? He says that. If anyone comes to him, he will not deny them. Not now, not ever. I have heard people use this verse and others like it in verse 44 and 45 where Jesus said this as an excuse. Well, I guess he didn't call me because that's why I'm not coming. You can, if you choose to come, God gave you that. Gave you the ability to do that. He has given everyone the ability to come to him who wants to come to him. Don't you understand what that means? If you have any desire to come to Jesus, it's a gift. It's a gift from God. Take it. Don't ignore it. Don't put it off. Come to him today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. For this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Don't throw it away. Just like the song, don't throw it away. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. We've all known someone who came for a while. You remember the story of the parable of the soils, the parable of the seeds, the parable of the sower. It's all the same story. Scattering of seeds. Some fell on the hard ground and, didn't, and couldn't take root. It, couldn't, it was just nothing there. Some fell on the shallow ground. It wasn't deep enough. There was not enough moisture. Some fell among the thorns and it grew up for a while, but the concerns of this life choked it out. We've all known people who have been exposed to the gospel but yet, for whatever reason, it didn't quite take. I know people who have had profound emotional experiences in church or at uh, crusades like Billy Graham crusades or whatever, and for a while have followed. But then they got caught up in, well, I've got to work 100 hours a week to pay off my debt. Or, uh, well... Sunday's my only day off, and besides, the kids have soccer that day. Um, you name it, I'm not going to go through a whole list, but there's always some excuse why they can't quite make it to church. You invite them to a Bible study. They, these are folks that are busy to all kinds of, doing all kinds of things, but they never quite seem to have the time or the desire to follow Jesus. I ask you, 
and I'm not going to pass judgment. It's not up to me to pass judgment. I ask you, are they true followers of Jesus Christ? I don't know. I can't be certain. I'm not the judge. It's not up to me to judge. It's not up really up to you to judge. But I ask you, if it always seems to, that somebody always has some reason, some other more important thing than worshiping God who created them and sustains their life, there's always some other major reason. Or more often than not, there's some reason for them to not follow Jesus, to be doing whatever it is they want to do and not what the Bible says they're supposed to be doing. I'm going to say odds are, and I can't guarantee it, but odds are they're not really, they're not really following Jesus. I'm sorry if that's harsh. I don't mean to be mean here. That's not my intention. In fact, it pains me to say that. There are many people I know, at least a number of people I know, that I love dearly. And I really genuinely believe that their intentions are good. But somehow Jesus and fellowship, studying his Bible, studying his word, somehow going to church, listening to Christian radio, listening to Christian music, whatever, all the different ways you can get the word of God into your mind and into your heart, never quite makes it to the, to the top of the priority list. Is it yours? Is it yours? Is Jesus anywhere near the top of your priority list? Is fellowship with him and obedience to him anywhere near the top of your priority list? Is there always something else that's kind of squeezing them out? Are you kidding yourself in thinking that you're really following Jesus? Or are you really following Jesus? I'm not talking legalism here. I'm talking about what matters to you. So Jesus said to the twelve, you do not want to go away also, do you? Well, in the Greek, this question is essentially expecting a negative answer. It's a rhetorical question. The response is great. Verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Eternal life isn't by and by, pie in the sky. It's now. When he gives us eternal life, it's now. It's an eternal focus in our life. Eternal life now. Not some, something down the road. Okay? In Acts 4.12, Peter says, for there is no, Apostle Peter says, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father but by me. No one. He's it. If you want to know eternal life now, if you want to know purpose in your life now, if you want to understand, and you need to understand, and you need to believe who Jesus is, He's the eternal Son of God. He eternally existed, came down and became human for the sole purpose of dying for our sins, living a sinless life, dying on the cross to pay the penalty so that we could have an eternal relationship and fellowship with God and not suffer the eternal punishment. He paid the price. You have the option of accepting that and we need to accept that sometimes every single day. It's not necessarily a once and done. Repentance from our sins and turning to Jesus as a Christian is a lifestyle. It's not a once and done. I have to repent every single day for some lousy attitude because I drive a truck. I drive a truck for my regular secular living and truck drivers will laugh and say, if you're not swearing at people on the road, you're not paying attention. Well, I can tell you, I don't do that anywhere near as much as I used to. <laughs> and I use nicer words now, by the grace of God. But I have to ask God for forgiveness for a lousy attitude or something, or a selfish, being selfish, every day. We need the gospel and we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. We need Jesus 
and His Holy Spirit and His Word and the Father every day in every way. We need Him. Why? He designed us and created us to need Him. You cannot know peace and purpose. You cannot be on the pathway to eternal life apart from Him. Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know what? That you are the Holy One of God. From Isaiah is where that comes from. The other apostles that wrote in Matthew, Mark, and Luke used different titles here because they remembered it a little differently. But they were all divine titles of Jesus Christ. You are the Holy One of God. He said, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Now he thinks that he's speaking for all twelve. Peter is often the spokesman. Peter, I follow after Peter in a little bit in that I have the impulsive gift of blab. It's not terribly unusual for me to blather something out that isn't necessarily well thought out. But he was speaking from his heart, and it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. In verse 70, Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Now he met Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. This is one last little commentary by the Apostle John. Judas Iscariot is the prototypical false disciple. But there are lots of false disciples. Why was he false? He seemed to be following along. In fact, nobody amongst the twelve, the other ones in the twelve, seemed to have any clue until the last, the last of the, er, Jesus' earthly ministry that Judas was false, a false disciple. He showed all of the signs, apparently, as far as we know, that he was one of them. Do we know who the real disciples are amongst us? I think you can be a fruit inspector and have a pretty good idea. But every single one of them following Jesus didn't know. When Jesus later on mentions, one of you will betray me, some of them said, it's not going to be me. I'm paraphrasing, of course, is it? But Jesus always knew. Why? Why was Judas going along with this? Well, he had his own designs. He had his own plans. He had his own ambition. How many politicians have you seen and heard get up there in, in campaign season and tell you about how much they love Jesus or they love God? You never heard it from them before. You're not going to hear it from them after the campaign season is over. But while they're running, they'll tell you they love the God, they love the God of the Bible or whatever. Really? Is it really true? There are preachers and teachers on certain TV stations that will tell you all about the wonderfulness they're following Jesus and so forth and so on. The fruit of their life shows that that's not true. They're in it for the money. For the, for the fame, for the adoration. That's why I'm here, for the money. <laughs> and the fame. <laughs> the final question here, and then I'll close. Are you following Jesus for all the right reasons? Are you following Jesus because he is the way and the truth and the life? Are you spending time with Jesus? Are you making him a priority in your life? The choice really is yours. The choice is yours. Now, I'm here to tell you that if you choose something else, something else is more important. 
Something else is worth more of your time. Something else is worth more of your emotional investment, more of your money. If something else is more important than Jesus, following Jesus, knowing his word, spending time in fellowship with him and his word in fellowship with his people, worshiping him, sharing him, if something else is more important than that, you need to examine yourself. And I tell you this as a warning because I've been there. And quite frankly, Jesus had to put me through some rough stuff to get me on track. And you've all heard that, most of you, if not all of you. So I want you to think about it. Examine yourself. Are you a true disciple? Following Jesus for the truth. Do you believe his word, or are you just after what he can provide you? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are God. You know all things, and we do not. But you give us the opportunity to know you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we know that according to your word, according to the very words of Jesus, apart from him, we can do nothing. But Father, you have promised that if we put our faith and trust in him and believe him, believe his word, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That we will be in your righteous right hand and no man will be able to remove us from it. Father, for that we thank you. I pray that you bless us in every way that you can in Jesus Christ. Amen.